The Golden Amazons of Venus by John Murray Reynolds from Planet Stories, Winter 1939 as found on Project Gutenberg read by Julie Hoverson The Golden Amazons of Venus, Part 6 There were sixty or eighty prisoners fastened in the field to serve as bait for the giant Dacta. About half were golden Amazons captured in various raids. The remainder were men and women of the green people of Giri, prisoners condemned to death by the grim and ruthless tribunals of the Scaly Ones. Now a dozen attendants carrying leather buckets ran up and down the lines of the captives, splashing each victim with a dipper full of a purple-colored and very pungent oil. "'Now what's the game?' Jerry muttered. Angus bent his head to sniff at the heavy liquid, tricking down his hairy chest. "'It smells like a harlot's dream!' he muttered sourly. "'Probably intended to make us more attractive to whatever kind of creature it is that's coming after us.' The attendants had hurried away with their buckets full of oil, and now the crowds in the grandstand and on the plain settled down to wait. They were in holiday mood, laughing and talking in their shrill voices. Then a black dot appeared high up in the sky. A murmur of anticipation ran over the crowd. The dacta came plummeting earthward as its super-keen senses saw and smelled the attractive bait waiting below. The thing, as it came near, was like some figment from a nightmare. It had a reptilian body between a twenty-foot spread of leathery wings and a long beak with a double row of pointed teeth. One of the things that Jerry had seen flying over that lonely sea when he first brought the Viking down through the canopy of clouds that covered the planet of Venus. So that is a doctor, Angus muttered. Bonny little creature. The winged lizard checked its flight momentarily, some ten feet off the ground, directly above one of the captive Amazons. Then he dove down. The girl screamed and twisted away to the length of her tether, and the toothed beak just missed her. The first of the hunters fired as the dacta whirled and lashed out again, but the bullet exploded off to one side. Gripping the writhing Amazon with his beak and his clawed feet, the dacta flapped his great wings and soared upward again. Two more of the hunters fired together. One of the explosive bullets missed entirely. The other blew one of the girl's legs to pieces, but did not harm the monster that held her. Then Lansa tossed aside his green robe and stood up. Jerry saw that he held a ray tube, either one from the Stardust or one of the new ones he now claimed to be able to make in Girivaka. The tube slanted upward. Murky light played around its muzzle. The Dacta gave a shrill and almost human scream, then it dropped its mangled victim and fell twitching to the ground. Its leathery skin was turned black where the ray blast had struck it. Along the edge of the field, the close-packed crowds broke into wild cheering, and Lansa acknowledged it with a condescending gesture of one upraised arm. Elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, wrist. The hunt went on. Sometimes the Dacta came singly, sometimes in pairs. The hunters had the range better now and dropped them consistently. On several occasions, the flying lizards were brought down before they had time to seize a victim at all, but most of the time one of the prisoners was killed or mortally wounded before the Dacta was slain. A green man tethered to the stake next beyond Clozana had been ripped about the throat by the raking teeth of a Dacta's bill and was breathing with a sort of gurgling moan as he bled to death. So far, that was the nearest that one of the flying lizards had come to Jerry and his two companions. And then Jerry saw the thing for which he had been watching. There was a streak of fire along the eastern horizon, the blast of speeding rocket tubes. A cigar-shaped hull of gleaming blue and silver came streaking across the saffron sky with a trail of smoke behind it. The Viking had come. A swelling uproar came from the crowds, which began to mill about in confusion. Lansa had risen to his feet and was peering upward with one hand raised to shade his eyes. Yellow flames played about the Viking's bow as the reverse rockets checked her momentum. A pair of swooping Dacta veered away from her, then dropped down toward the bait tethered below. One of them was headed straight for Angus McTavish. Instantly, one of the forward ray guns on the spaceship glowed to life and the winged lizard crumpled in mid-flight. Jerry knew then that someone on board had been looking down through the powerful viewing glasses and had recognized him and Angus. He shouted hoarsely, knowing he would not be heard, but unable to keep silent. Drums were throbbing a swift alarm, and the milling crowds were in wild confusion. 
Companies of the scaly warriors were firing by volley, but the explosive bullets only flashed harmlessly against the Viking's duralite hull. Some of the heavier gas guns set on the battlements above hissed into life then, but even the larger caliber explosives could make no impression on tempered duralite. With her ray guns flashing and ripping black swathes in the scaly ranks below, with her helicopters spinning to take the strain as the blast of the rockets died away, the Viking settled rapidly groundward. By the Lord, Steve came a-fightin', McTavish roared. Of course, you old goat, Jerry shouted back. Did you really think I'd call the ship into a trap? You're as bad as that maniac who calls himself Lanza. I knew that if I spoke too strongly of what nice fellows these scaly devils are, Steve would have the sense to know that I was under pressure and in a trap. And then came swift disaster. Over the edge of the nearest blackened, battlemented wall of Lance's palace thrust the muzzle of a large-caliber ray gun. Steve Brent saw it, too, and tried to lift the nose of his ship to bring his own guns to bear on this new menace, but he was too late. The muzzle of the ray gun on the battlements glowed dully. The blast of the supode rays struck the row of spinning helicopters on top of the Viking's hull. The blades of the big propellers went spinning into space, their shafts bent and crumpled like straws in a gale. Robbed of their support, essential when lacking rocket power of at least 300 miles per hour, the spaceship plunged downward like a falling star. She struck the wa waters of the lake with a mighty splash. Spray dashed as high as the walls of Lance's castle, and when it was gone, the spaceship had vanished. Jerry Norton stood motionless. He was staring at the muddy and foam-flecked waters of the lake and at the spreading ripples that still beat on the shore as the effect of that mighty splash subsided. At the moment, he felt old and tired and defeated. His brain numbed. The Viking was gone. Freckled Steve Brent and the cheerful Portok and all the rest of them were gone, buried deep in the muddy bottom of a Venusian lake. The second expedition from Earth to this cloud-veiled and ill-fated planet had also ended in disaster. In the future, the Viking would be classed with the Stardust, simply another luckless spaceship that sailed away into the void and vanished. The men of her crew and what they tried to accomplish would be forgotten. Their names would only remain on some yellowing record buried in the maze of government files. So deep was Jerry Norton's bitter brooding that he scarcely heard the words Angus McTavish was shouting in his ear. Come on, Jerry lad! Let's get away while there's all this confusion! Ever since they had been brought to this field beside the lake, Angus had been working at his bonds. He was a very strong man anyway, and the swell of his earthly muscles was far greater than the strength of any of the races that the scaly ones were accustomed to making prisoners. While the attention of all the guards was absorbed in the appearance and subsequent wreck of the Viking, Angus had managed to snap his own bonds and was now unhurriedly freeing Jerry's wrists. Jerry ran to Clozana and untied her hands, while Angus freed the nearest other prisoner, who was a stocky and broad-shouldered green man with a heavily lined face. As soon as his hands were free, the latter wheeled to face them. "'My thanks, Hizirin, he panted. "'Now go while you can. You are more easily spotted in a crowd than I.' Hurry, I will free as many of these others as possible. Get into the city and try to reach the place men call the Square of the Dragon. Say that Sarnak sent you. Hurry! Even though he was carrying Clozana in his arms, Jerry's earthly muscles allowed him to run in mighty six-foot bounds. Angus went leaping along before him. So great was the confusion that they were halfway across the plain to the city before anyone noticed them at all. Then a shouting officer of the Scaly Ones threw himself in front of them with his drawn sword in his hand. The big engineer roared like an angry bull and leapt clean over the man. Before the Scaly Warrior could turn, the Scot had him from behind. An instant later, Angus had the sword and was racing ahead, while the Venusian lay sprawled in the mud with his neck broken and his long head twisted grotesquely awry. The half-dozen guards posted in the arch of the gate stared indecisively at the white-skinned trio racing toward them. Angus had a sword in each hand by this time, and he leapt at the guards with a shout. The fugitive broke through the line of swordsmen by sheer momentum and dashed into the city. There was no pursuit. The first of the panic-stricken throng rushing back for the shelter of the city reached the gate a moment later, and the guards were swamped by a jostling mob of mingled scaly ones and green men. 
Jerry and his two companions darted into the nearest of the many narrow alleys that twisted about this part of the city. They dodged from one dingy thoroughfare to the next. When they met a woman of the green people, Jerry unceremoniously tore off her robe and shielding veil and flung them to Clozana to hide her own tawny skin and golden hair. Later, when he and Angus had also disguised themselves in the rough garments worn by the poorer folk of the city of Wackerhausen, they were able to walk quietly down the streets without fear of detection unless they met a patrol at close range. At last they came to a dingy plaza that was surrounded by ramshackle buildings of great age. It had probably once been a prosperous and fashionable part of the city, centuries ago, before the scaly ones overran the land of Geary. Now grass grew up between the paving stones, and the roofs of the dingy buildings sagged close to the breaking point, and piles of festering rubbish lay along the gutters. The place was a slum of the sort that had not existed on the more enlightened planets of Earth and Mars for many generations. A canal flowed along one side of the square, and in the center of the plaza stood the eroded and ancient black marble statue of a rearing dragon. This must be the place, Angus muttered from the shadows of the hood that he had drawn up over his head. As they hesitated, a few people peered furtively out at them from the broken windows and sagging doors of the houses around the square. Then a man came toward them. He was bent and crippled, a beggar wearing filthy rags. His matted hair hung down over his eyes and his whole body seemed covered with the caked filth of one who had never thought of washing. As the man came forward with a sort of limping shuffle, Jerry instinctively laid his hand on the hilt of the sword he carried concealed under his cloak, while Clozana drew the concealing veil more closely over her face. "'Alms, Hiziren, a little charity of your generosity?' the beggar whined as he came closer. "'What place is this?' Jerry asked, trying to give his voice the soft tone and lisping accent characteristic of the green men. The beggar limped a little closer and peered up into the shadows of Jerry's hood. What he saw seemed to satisfy him. "'Take your hand from your sword-hilt, friend,' he said in a low voice, quite unlike his previous whine. "'What place do you seek?' "'The place of the dragon.' "'This is it. Who sent you?' "'Sarnak sent us.' "'It is good.' The beggar pointed down a flight of worn stone steps that led to the canal, whose surface was some eight or ten feet below the level of the plaza." Go down there below the bridge and tap on the stone that bears a rusted iron ring. You will find friends. Go quickly while there are no strangers to observe you. Do you trust that man? Angus whispered in English as they turned away. Jerry shrugged. We've got to. It's our only chance. We're too easy to recognize in spite of these clothes to stay free in the city for long. The black waters of the canal flowed sluggishly along between slimy stone walls. Refuse drifted on the surface. The water itself had a foul and penetrating odor. Jerry walked down the steps and then along the walk that stretched beside the water at one edge of the canal until he was under an arch that served as a bridge to support the street above. The arch was wide enough so that they were now completely hidden from the view of anyone in the plaza above. On one of the stones of the arch, at about the height of his shoulder, Jerry saw a rusted iron ring. He tapped on that stone with the hilt of his sword. He heard a faint click, and though there was no visible change in the surface of the pitted stone wall before him, he heard a whispered question. Who knocks? Friends, Jerry replied. Who sent you? Sarnak sent us. There was a low metallic jingle. A section of the wall about the height of a man and some three feet wide swung quietly inward. As soon as the three of them had stepped through the opening into a small room that was built in the interior of the arch, the door swung shut behind them. There were half a dozen men in this low-roofed and stone-walled chamber. All were of the green people, dressed as ragged beggars, but with the bearing and appearance of warriors. Drawn steel gleamed in their hands. Their faces were heavy with suspicion. One of the men had gone to stand with his back against the closed door behind them. "'Who are you that come using the name of Sarnak?' snapped the leader. Suspicion became blended with puzzled surprise as Jerry and Angus threw back their hoods and the outlaws saw their white skins. Hastily, Jerry told the tale of the Dacta hunt and of their subsequent escape. "'So Sarnak got away?' the leader of the green men exulted. "'Ho! Oh, that is the best news that we of the dragon's teeth have heard in many weeks! All right, Slag, take these strangers through to the inner places.' 
One of the green men beckoned to Jerry to follow him down a narrow flight of steps at the back of the room. It ended in a circular pool of water like a large well, the steps going on down below the surface. Their guide opened a cupboard built into the wall and took out four glass helmets. The helmets were attached to leather pads that fitted tightly about the shoulders and chest with straps to hold them in place. A cylindrical metal tank was attached to the back of each helmet with a tube that led to a valve at the side. The guide also took out some heavily leaded sandals. Put on these helmets and then open the valves, he explained. Then follow me down the steps. Be careful not fall in the darkness. After we get around the first bend in the corridor below, there will be light. Jerry put the globular glass helmet over his head, opening the valve as soon as he had adjusted the straps. The air in the helmet immediately took on a faintly chemical odor, but it was pleasant and in no way oppressive. As soon as all of them were ready, the man called Slag beckoned and then started down the steps. Warm black water rose to Jerry's knees, then to his waist. As it came up to his shoulders, he saw the top of Slag's helmet disappear below the surface ahead of him. For a moment, the smooth surface of the water was level with Jerry's eyes as it rose around his own helmet. Then he stepped down into a darkness as black and impenetrable as though he were immersed in ink. Jerry guided himself with his left hand on the slime-covered stones of the wall beside him. He reached back with his other hand to steady Clozana, who was just behind. Altogether, he counted thirty steps, feeling carefully with his feet each time before the floor leveled off. The wall curved around to the right. Jerry followed it, rounded a bend, and was no longer in darkness. They stood in a straight passage that was lined with blocks of polished stone. Metal plates, set in the ceiling at regular intervals, glowed with a greenish-yellow light that was nearly as bright as the cloudy Venusian daylight. The place was completely filled with water. It was an eerie sensation. Slag was standing a few feet ahead, grinning at them through the glass of his helmet, but now he turned and walked slowly down the corridor. Jerry followed him, bent well forward as he walked, forcing himself ahead against the resistance of the water. All their movements were sluggish and slow, but the heavily leaded sandals held them down and gave their feet purchase. <clears throat> Small fishes swam past them along the passage, their round eyes peering in through the helmet glasses as they passed. Clumps of colored seaweed grew out from the walls and ceiling, their long streamers waving gently in the slow currents set up by the passage of the men. In spite of the brightness of the light from the ceiling plates, the effect of the water made it difficult to see far down the passage ahead. The outlines of Slag were clear enough as he plodded along directly ahead of Jerry, but everything beyond him was a little blurred and uncertain. It was like living in a mirage. At last they came to a point where the passage branched. Here they passed a sentry who wore a glass helmet and a tight-fitting green rubber uniform. On his chest was the insignia of a rampant black dragon. He was armed with a very thin, almost needle-like sword whose point was razor-keen. Jerry realized the reason for that peculiarly designed weapon when the sentry swung his sword upward to salute their guide. The blade was so thin that it offered little resistance to the water, and its power of being quickly wielded made it a far more effective weapon underwater than a heavier sword would have been. They passed more branching passages and more rubber-clad sentries who stared at them curiously as they went by. There was a whole network of corridors in this underwater world, at last, Slag opened a metal door at the end of the particular passage he had followed, and they all crowded into a small room. Slag closed the door and dogged it, then tapped on a glass panel across the room. A silvery flood of air bubbles came pouring out of the end of a pipe that protruded through the wall. At the same time, Jerry heard the thud of heavy pumps starting to suck water through gratings at the base of the wall. The water level dropped rapidly. When it was down to their waists... Slag took off his helmet and slipped the leaded sandals from his feet. He motioned the others to do the same. "'We are about to enter the hidden realm of Lurala, the home of the dragon's teeth,' he said. "'If you can prove your right to be here, you will be welcome. Otherwise, you will go back into one of these water locks without any helmets on.' He grinned cheerfully. That was part six of The Golden Amazons of Venus by John Murray Reynolds. From Planet Stories, Winter 1939, as found on Project Gutenberg, narrated by Julie Hoverson. Music is from Zephon, as found on Gemindo.